Out of the most powerful ancient dragons that live in Faerun, we have already covered three. However, Imbraith is typically too busy excavating the desert of Anorok to mess with adventurers. Dargothoth is nowhere to be seen and people would really have to go out of their way to meet him. And Arvaturus is most active either in the far, far cold north or flying above the water in the coast, where it is frankly very rare to see adventurers at. Plus, Good luck reaching her lair in the middle of nowhere. The dragon that we're going to be covering today, however, is very, very close. Literally just around the corner. In fact, she is so close that she's known as an adventurer slayer. Out of her two favorite pastimes, one of them is to find adventurers and kill them. Again, good luck trying to convince your DM to take you onto some random ruins buried in the desert of Anorak to fight a blue dragon, or to sail the cold seas to a random island in the frozen north to fight a white dragon, or to get into an ancient gnomish city in the Underdark to fight a Dracolid but convincing your DM to let you walk to the literal closest forest from the city to challenge a green dragon? Well, anyone can do that. This one's lair is the Crypt Garden Forest, right there, just a day's ride from Waterdeep. Many adventurers have tried to kill her, and all of them have failed. Today, we're talking about Cloggy Liamatar, the ancient green dragon of the north. You'd be surprised the level of intelligence and misdirection that it takes to survive being this close to one of the strongest cities on the Sword Coast. But before we delve too deep, I am so unbelievably excited to announce to you guys my very own Kickstarter. I have designed a full Dungeons & Dragons 5e campaign for characters level 1 to level 11. War has come to the kingdom of Al'Kirat, and an unstoppable undead Null army has arisen under the control of Lord Amu, a cruel and powerful mummy king. This is a gritty adventure where the realities of war will come to the forefront. When an army of 30,000 soldiers march towards the capital city, the players will be forced to make tough decisions in order to survive. But these decisions are what will drive players in this hectic campaign. Sabotaging the enemy army, assassinating its leaders, disrupting its alliances, these are but a few of the choices players will have in contending with the impending clash. The better you weaken the enemy army and the more you empower your own or yourselves, the better the siege of Al'Kirat will go for you. The siege is imminent. You can't stop this relentless army that swallows town after town in its encroachment. But the decisions that you make along the way will change how the siege develops and whether doom is written in stone or merely in blood. This is the biggest thing that I have ever done. Go to the link below and check out the Kickstarter. We don't just have the book, but we also have a sick DM screen to go along with it. We have battle maps, magic item cards, more monster classes. We have an exclusive set of monster classes designed for this Kickstarter, where you can play as a troll, an earth elemental, or a gnoll. The Kickstarter will only be up for 30 days, so get it while you can. There is a lot of exclusive stuff in there, so just go and take a look. Link in the description below. Go to Kickstarter and check out Sands of Doom, my new full 5th edition adventure. Now, back to the video. Klogiliamatar is an ancient green dragon that layers in Crypt Garden Forest, specifically in a cave called Deeping Cave, far into the woods. Now, green dragons are naturally very mischievous and tricky, but to be able to not just reach the ancient stage, but to do so under the very nose of Waterdeep requires an immense level of manipulation and intelligence, without mentioning the extreme levels of paranoia and betrayal that one would have to struggle with every single day, but such things are exactly what Cloggy Liamatar lives for. To be able to understand this dragon, we're going to have to go deep into her psyche, into her obsessions. What is exactly that which drives her? Cloggy Liamatar is obsessed with urban life, as funny as that sounds. As she has in her possession four powerful crystal balls which she can use to cast a spell scry upon people or locations. Each crystal ball is enchanted with a different property. One ball allows her to detect magic upon the places that she scries, letting her see the magic items, the magical auras, or even if there are any spell casters in the region. Uh, this ability is so powerful in fact that she can even glean information such as uh, what is the most powerful spell level that a wizard has access to. It's pretty good. The second crystal ball allows her to cast detect 
thoughts upon anyone that she scries. The third ball lets her see invisible creatures, and the fourth and last crystal ball allows her to cast a spell telepathy on whoever she is scrying. Glogiliamatar basically spends most of her waking time using these crystal balls to spy upon the people of Faerun, specifically on the big cities, and specifically, specifically onto powerful female humans or elves within those cities. See, Glogiliamatar's biggest dream is to be able to live in a big urban city, to enjoy the bustle and intrigue of city life. Quote, Sometimes she dreams of an even better fate ruling Waterdeep as a human queen, her dragon nature hidden. Even more often, she sees herself an alluring mysterious lady all the noblemen and ambitious merchants of the city are wild over, as she glides from dark alley trist to gentle jests at parties, with all eyes on her and all tongues darting with the news of her latest outrageous deeds." End quote. She constantly spies on women of power in Waterdeep and Neverwinter, veering over their lives, over the way they handle business, how they treat servants or other nobles, how they manipulate men in romance. In particular, Klugilamatar loves what she calls secret power. It's not the kind of power that strong people might use to enforce their will, you know, like using might or threats, but instead, she likes the kind of power that is more subtle. The schemes, the plotting, the type of power that almost appears like it has been handed on to you in a silver platter, when in reality there was a lot of effort that was expended in the background to produce that effect. The problem that Klogiliamatar has is that her magic is uh, pitiful and weak. As an ancient green dragon, she is formidable in raw power, but she's not interested in raw power. Power. She's interested in magic, of which she is relatively inept. She has spent considerable effort and time attempting to figure out a way to be able to change her form into that of a beautiful female human while still maintaining her draconic might. It's something, of course, quite easy for metallic dragons to do, but very difficult for chromatic dragons to do. Simple illusions will not do what she wants to accomplish, and polymorph spells would relinquish her of her draconic power while transformed, so, so far she hasn't quite had much luck getting what she needs. Quote, she was almost tricked into servitude once by a wizard, Hyrix Greentree of Waterdeep, whom she hired to craft her a shape change spell. The magic would have transformed her into a beautiful human maiden, yet leave her able to call on her magic, breath weapon, and immunities. She discovered, however, that while in human form she would have been Hyrix's charmed slave, and he would have ensured that her desire to return to dragon shape was firmly quenched. Hyrix died slowly and painfully, and if the phantom of a screaming wizard silently fades into view from time to time, above the spell scroll Klogiliamatar keeps carefully hidden in a coffer beneath the floor of her lair, she ignores it." End quote. She dreams of being able to become a human female and live in either Waterdeep or Neverwinter and experience the same fun life that she has been watching other powerful women live through her divinations. What's funny is that she has been scrying over Illustrial Silverhand from the city of Silvery Moon, as always, just being interested in court and the women that govern within it. But the city officials of the city actually realized that they were being spied upon, and so they designed a, a form of illusory spell that only activates whenever it senses that the green dragon is spying upon them. And so what it does is it fabricates made-up scenes of intrigue and political drama that are fake, of course, but really interesting. These uh, made-up scenes are keeping Klogiliamatar heavily invested like a form of TV show with villains and plot twists. In fact, they even designed the main character to be a handsome man that is secretly a green dragon in disguise, who seduces the powerful women of the court in order to gain political power. Uh, Klogiliamatar has been sending some of her minions over to Silvery Moon in an attempt to contact this person, which of course is fake, which is again just so funny to me. 
Now, for Clogiliamatar, these are mostly fantasies. She, of course, like, wishes that she could do these things, but she is far too clever and, I mean, too old to understand that they are merely fantasies and that the reality is that she would be too scared to walk upon Waterdeep or any similar city, even if she were to look like a human. The threat of getting killed is just... is just far too great, and so she mostly sits in her lair just divining other women and while literally living vicariously through them. Quote, Her servants say old Gnawbone sighs often as she stares into her crystal balls. End quote. Sad, but that's how it is. Now, she does interact a lot with the cities, just not in person. And she has her own criminal organization called the Gnawbones that kind of work as a semi-official business organization, but obviously uh, doing a lot of shady business in the background. For example, a very popular scheme that she runs is she will purchase a lot of a certain product in order to hoard it. Then she goes and destroys caravans or ships that typically carry that product in order to reduce the supply. That way, when the city has run out of those products, she can unload the ones that she has been hoarding at a tremendous markup and gain a big profit. I should say though, because it is important, she actually doesn't care about the money, which is really interesting for a dragon. To her, it is all about the power, but again, the secret power that comes along when one possesses capital. And just the very fact that she has an organization is cool to her. And the fact that she can command like minions or people in the city to do her will is very cool to her. She loves feeling like a boss, like it is all a game to her. For example, in her lair, she has human servants, but she doesn't like, you know, beat them or, or torture them or threaten them or anything like that. Instead, she has them serve her. But what she does is she commands them to be totally naked, except for bindings on their legs and arms. Uh, bindings which are totally fake, like they could just take them off whenever they wanted to. Now, these naked servants, which are always men, rub her soft scales with oil. Then, when they are done, they are allowed to take as much as they can carry, with a single hand, any gold from her hoard as recompense. Now, this is interesting for a few reasons. Once again, she doesn't actually care about like the gold itself, so she gives it away. What she cares about is that her servants want it. The servant knows what she wants, for them to be naked and to rub her with oil, and so they do it. Because they get that gold. This is the secret power that she likes. She doesn't have to threaten them, she doesn't have to beat them, they just simply do what she wants and do so willingly and happily. You know, these are activities that would be considered demeaning to them and enjoyable for her, such as them being naked and rubbing oil on her while wearing bindings that they could remove but choose not to. They do all of this for her while she lounges. That is, the kind of power she likes. Of course, she is heavily neurotic and, and uses her crystal balls to spy on all of her servants, making sure that she murders those that behave opposite to what she wants. Again, going back to it, she likes the type of power that looks like it is being done passively, while actually there is a lot of work that goes behind the scenes. In fact, this particular personality trait of her is, funnily enough, the reason why other big dragons leave her alone. They know very well that she is willing to put in the work in the background just to screw over someone a little bit. Quote, Having her own way is everything to Clogiliamatar. Among other dragons, her reputation for trickery makes her best avoided. Balagos, for instance, considers her a twisted, crabbed thing, given to petty silliness and as such, beneath his notice. She is a tireless foe who goes to ridiculous lengths to cause even small harm to someone she regards as an enemy. And this, worry all the bones, trait has most other dragons leave her alone. This is just fine for old Gnawbone, as it leaves her free to pursue her schemes wrapped in the presumption of her own supremacy over other dragons. It also leaves her Great Waterdeep as part of her territory. That more than a dozen steel dragons and were dragons dwell in the city under her very nose and generally regard her activities with amusement is something she serenely ignores, even when one of her agents is imprudent enough to point it out to her." End quote. Basically, to put it lightly and excuse the language here, Clogiliamatar is a petty bitch. And that makes her really dangerous, because she's willing to go the lengths to screw someone over 
that she doesn't like. Now, I should also mention her nickname is Old Gnawbone, because whenever she is seen flying about, she's often seen with a dangling corpse on her mouth, as she likes to suck on or, or very slowly eat people for snacks as she flies. Now, you might be wondering, of course, how is she still alive? See, because whenever adventurers go out to hunt her, uh, she kills them. She's always at the ready, being as paranoid as she is, being able to scry upon anything that moves within the city, also having a lot of minions that patrol her forest for her, but as well having a lot of traps all around the perimeter of her lair. And this is without even mentioning the fact that she is a very powerful dragon in her own right. In fact, her accolades are very impressive. She is known to have killed thousands, like, act like hordes of orcs from many of the hordes that have formed over the centuries here in the north of Virun. Now, of course, we know that orcs like to hide in the forests and destroy them for their weapons of war, and so uh, many of them have perished in Crib Garden Forest thinking that they could handle old Gnawbone. Uh, she has a very strong taste for humanoids, which is actually one of the reasons why she hunts adventurers so much. So whenever a good orc horde gets formed, it's just a good reason for her to go slaying. Uh, she also single-handedly destroyed a burgeoning elvish kingdom called Elvrin about 200 years ago, just like slaughtered everyone in there. She is very strong. However, the reality is that as strong as she is, she probably wouldn't be able to survive, say, Force Grey from Waterdeep hunting her down. Thing is, most of her efforts are spent manipulating information such as to make most people doubt whether she's even alive or where she's located at the moment, or to use the enemy's strength against them. A good example was the incredibly scary trick that she used to completely destroy a noble house from Waterdeep. See, she basically appeared in front of the Broken Gulf family manor. This is, by the way, the most famous story of Clogiliamatar. She appeared in front of this manor, magically disguised as a silver dragon. She offered to hunt herself for a large sum of money, which the noble family accepted. And then she used her scrying magic to figure out where the money that they were going to pay her with was being assembled. Then she flew over there, killed everyone, and stole the money. Then, using a bunch of illusion magic, she fabricated this elaborate battle scene in the forest, using sound and explosions and shaking trees and stuff like that to make it look like there was a huge battle between the two dragons. Then she shows up to the manor, disguised as the original silver dragon, claiming to have defeated herself and demanding payment. Of course, they didn't really have much money because the money that they had organized to pay with originally had been stolen by her prior, but the noble family did the best to accrue as much as they could to pay, filling up an entire boat with gold, which she then took. Then she went back into her lair in Crypt Garden Forest and filled it up with traps and moved all of her gold away, all of her treasure. Then she showed up, as herself, into the manor of the Broken Gulf family, claiming, Hey, you sent a silver dragon to kill me. What the hell? Pay me twice what you paid him, or I will kill you in revenge. She then toppled a grand tower from the manor, like, killed three of the, of the main, like, patriarch's sisters, and then crippled him for life as a threat. So the guy, the patriarch of the family, paid her the money, basically bankrupting his entire estate to do so, while she destroyed a few more buildings on her way out. She knew now that the might of Waterdeep was about to come crashing down on her for basically attacking a noble right on his home. So now, having emptied out her lair and trapping the whole place, she just left to a different forest and chilled for a while. See, part of her master plan involved the incursion of a rival green dragon named Andracritar, who as of late had been invading her territory. So she waited until one such day when the rival green dragon was in her forest to do all of this. So when the powerful army of Waterdeep with all of their mages came invading the forest to look for her, instead they found the other green dragon and promptly slayed him. So the end result was Clogiliamatar receiving close to the entirety of the wealth of a massive noble family, the destruction of one of her powerful rivals, and the belief from the city that old Nobone was dead, when in reality, she wasn't. That was a masterstroke from her, winning at every possible angle. This is why you don't mess with old Nobone. Literally a dragon so smart, 
that other dragons just simply do not attack out of fear that she's gonna pull some kind of trick on them and destroy them. Now, because of her seeming inability to find the magic that she requires, or a wizard that she can trust that will help her transform into a human while keeping her draconic power, uh, she has started working on a long-form project to create herself her own wizard that might grant her the ability. And she has started studying for the possibility of basically adopting, adopting a child. A child with particularly potent magical proclivities and then raising this child to be a powerful mage. It's not a bad plan either, since it would only take like 40 or 70 years for this child to grow old into a good wizard. A cheap change really for a dragon that lives for thousands of years. She would then also raise this child in such a benevolent way so as to have the child trust her enough to grant her the boon of transformation. And she is so invested in this idea, actually, that she started to consider the possibility of doing this, but en masse. Getting, like, a bunch of children together in multiple different locations. That way, if one turns on her or is killed, then her time wouldn't have been entirely wasted. And if a bunch of these children work out into becoming powerful mages that are willing to work for her, then she would have a small army of wizards ready to do her bidding. It is a great plan, actually. Now, most of Clogil Yamatar's plans really do rely on and work around humans for the most part. And basically, never around dragons. She feels that she has no use for dragons, and it's not particularly interested in mating whatsoever. Thinking that getting pregnant and having children is not just useless towards her plans, but would actively slow her down and just create more rivals for her. It is also worth noting um, that, that her sexual proclivities are a, a little <laughs> different from your standard dragon. This is not something that is written like outright on the lore, but different passages just kinda suggested. See, she has naked male human servants that oil her. She fantasizes about human trice and romantic escapades and about having humans desire her. She specifically seeks to not mate with any dragon and also, weirdly enough, she does have a half Etten, half dragon child. So yeah, she must have reproduced with an Etten at some point lately because Ettins don't live that long. So yeah, all these things put together kind of, you know, paint an interesting picture of old Nobone's activities. Now, that being said, she has reproduced with dragons in the past. We know from Adventures League in 5th edition that she does have an adult green dragon son that does join the Cult of the Dragon. But dragons do live a long time, so that mating must have happened a very long time ago. And it is also worth noting that uh, this child is a 5th edition inclusion. Before 5th edition, she didn't have any children that we knew of. But yeah, a lot of Clogil Yamatar is just kind of funny, so I figured that I would mention it. Again, more comedic touches to this dragon. It's a really funny dragon. But yeah, to finish off the video, let's talk a bit about her lair and treasure. So like I said before, her lair is in a cave in Crypt Garden Forest called Deeping Cave. The cave is on a ravine at the foot of a large mountain that is filled with several tombs and abandoned dwarf holds, including a lot of monster-infested complexes. She uses a lot of humanoids to guard both her caverns and the forest surrounding the cavern. In particular, humans, halflings, and recently a fair amount of hobgoblins. She also has a lot of power over certain woodland beings that she can control. She knows some very basic druidic magic that allows her to summon weak-faced spirits, uh, but her natural green dragon magic does allow her to use many of the beasts of the forest as her minions. Now, the inside of her lair is said to be very odd, with a lot of phosphorescent and glowing mushrooms and, and really tall fungi. Uh, at the end of the cave, she would lay over a massive pile of coins that would form her bed as she lazily watches over the world around her using her many crystal balls. Now, since Clogiliamatar doesn't particularly care about treasure, her horde is comparatively small to other dragons of her size and age. Uh, she really does spend it all on me in, in gaining influence in Neverwinter and Waterdeep, and in improving all of her organizations. Uh, currently, the Horde, as it stands in her lair, has 12,000 uh, gold pieces worth of coinage, which is a mere fraction of what she stole from the Broken Gulf noble family. She has about 7,000 gold pieces worth of gems, uh, 15 tall busts of powerful human women worth 1,000 gold pieces each, 
uh, her four crystal balls, of course, a hand of the mage, a ring of chameleon power, which she wears, a ring of draconic deception, which she also wears, and a rod of spheres, which she also actively wears. So those last three ones would be the items that she would be attuned to. Now, those tall busts of powerful human women are those she looted from ancient tombs from across the land, and painstakingly moved them here just because it reminds her of what she wishes that she could be. Now, Cloglyamatar has a pretty massive challenge rating of 28, which really does come down to her being an ancient green dragon, plus having four levels in rogue, and then another four levels in druid. These make her a lot more formidable, especially when fighting on a forest where she can hide very well, and of course use her druidic magic at its best. Other than this though, her stats are pretty straightforward. She doesn't really have like any special magical abilities or, or crazy supernatural features like some of the other dragons that we have talked about. She is just like straight up just a really old green dragon with a lot of minions, a lot of traps, a lot of ingenuity and intelligence. It's actually again kind of funny that in reality, she is extremely physically imposing and powerful, but she deeply believes that she's not, which is, is interesting. She often goes out of her way to avoid challenging anyone directly for fear that she will be defeated. And she thinks that she is frail and weak, but when put to the test, she always come out on top. Having this mentality has allowed her to stay alive all these years when other dragons have gotten cocky and paid the price. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I apologize for the video delay. It's been working on the Kickstarter, as you can imagine. But the video should not be coming out super fast, so expect another one in like three or so days. We're gonna be burning through them. It'll be fantastic. Do go look at the Kickstarter. The link is in the description. It's not just the adventure, but we also have a lot of products in there, so make sure to browse to see what's available. I know a lot of you have been asking me for a softcover book release of my monster classes, and I have not just gone ahead and done that for you, but even added new support classes to them as well. The extra monster classes soft cover book has all of the nine monster classes that I've already released, but every single monster has an extra subclass to it. Uh, the pledge tier that I personally recommend is the champion's loot tier if you're trying to get the best value for as little money. The DM screen and the battle maps are of course necessary for optimal play, plus you get some really sweet voice acting and music for the running of the campaign. Uh, then I would buy the PDF version of the Sands of Doom monster classes so that you can play the Troll, the Null, and the Earth Elemental for just an extra $10. That is probably the best value per buck if you want to be efficient and have an amazing experience. Go ahead and check it out. Sands of of doom on Kickstarter. Now I would like to take a moment to appreciate my beloved patron supporters, Berry Mascan, 5e Magic Shop, Rusty Rain, Dog Feeder, The Great Codini, Omega Scales, Terry Kolb, Falky951, Ordoric, Thomas Hunt, Soulless Rider, Stalia, Trev909, Trevor Hess, The Living Guild Pack, The Wizard's Vault, Herbert Johnson, Shane and Sam Skinner, Steven, Naxtor Rashura, James the Perverted, Shuddycast, Chrissy3, Lucas Cyric, Murden Games, John Harley, Sir Ignatius Thunderblade, Warren Smith, Wyvern Claw 00, Loa, Falcon Scientist, Richard Sawyer, Mavrath, Master of Secrets, Lauren, Guy Broman, Spasak, and Lee Sward for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. If you would like to support me as well, then please head on over to patreon.com slash Rex to support. Alright guys, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for being here. Check out the Kickstarter and I'll see you all next time.